Bongiorno, and welcome to The Author's Preface, the show that explores how authors and their stories are forged. I'm your host, Sam Hale. Thanks for coming back. So, what's good with me? Not a whole lot. Continuing to work on my current novel on Draft 4. Quite excited. If you'd like to see updates of that, you can check out my Patreon, Samuel Hale, or patreon.com forward slash Samuel Hale. And it's going quite well. I'm pretty excited about it. I also put out, if you're interested, sneak peeks at upcoming guests for the pod. But if you'd like to wait, you can always check out my Twitter at Sam Hale. Yeah, where I am doing a little bit of foreshadowing here and there with my tweets. Might be a fun way of sleuthing your way toward the next guest. And since I want to get right into the intro, because we've got a nice juicy pod ahead of us, quick reminder that if you're enjoying things, please rate and review. It does make a difference. I've seen a bit of an uptick lately in analytics, and I don't think it's coincidence that that coincides with some fresh ratings. Greatly appreciated if you're one of those folks, or if you're just checking out the show and enjoying yourself, always appreciated. And like I mentioned, we've got a large pot ahead of us. You may have noticed in the title, this is part one of a two-part series with my guest, Jacobo de la Quercha. But who is Jacobo and why, like Solomon, did we decide to split this baby in half? Jacobo is an award-winning educator, essayist, and novelist. His works have been featured on BBC America, Business Insider, CNN Money, Folger Magazine, The Huffington Post, Politico Magazine, Reader's Digest, Ripley's Believe It or Not, Slate, and Princeton University's Electronic Bulletin of the Dante Society of America. And that's among other publications. Jacobo focuses on historical fiction, comedy, satire, and academic nonfiction. His works include the great Abraham Lincoln pocket watch conspiracy, License to Quill, which I read in prep for the pod, as well as McTrump. Accolades awards include various grants with Humanities New York, the New York State branch of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And education includes degrees in history and political science. Hobbies include, uh, I always appreciate this, video games, board games, film, reading, and like most authors I know, taking nice long walks. You can find Jacobo at jacobodelacuercia.com. Jacobo is spelled J-A-C-O-P-O, de la, D-E-L-L-A, Quercha, Q-U-E-R-C-I-A.com, Jacobo de la Quercha.com. And then on Twitter, at Jacobo underscore de la underscore Q. What do we discuss today? Like my previous guest, Samuel Akhtar, we got to talk about video games, primarily Assassin's Creed, which uses historical backdrops to tell stories with such potential, but that don't always stick the landing, as well as how there's a meta aspect to that game that doesn't need to be there because history, not only is it stranger than fiction, but it tends to be far more interesting on its own. And that in his writing, he prefers to not only entertain, but to educate. And getting to why we split this guy in half, we started with Jacobo's preface and got to the inspiration portion And, in back channels prior to recording, had discussed Joseph Campbell's monomyth, a.k.a. The Hero's Journey, as well as his seminal work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Which, by the way, man, that is such a great title. That sounds like a great sci-fi and or fantasy novel. And Jacobo uses Star Wars as a case study, giving us both a chance to nerd out, which was quite delightful, I must admit, but using Star Wars as a case study to understand proper and less than stellar executions of the monomyth. Star Wars being such a great example from the original up to more recent iterations within the series. And I like to think of this as a bit of a masterclass. Jacopo's very talented storyteller, his experience and knowledge, not only of the monomyth, but of screenwriting, of novel writing, just storytelling in general, is copious and entertaining. I found myself learning and, as per his mission statement, being entertained. And since there are so many resources we're discussing in this pod, As is always the case with every pod I've recorded, everything is listed in the show notes, be that novels, screenplays, YouTube clips, whatever it is, it's always in the show notes. So if you're really intrigued by something mentioned in this pod, or any of them for that matter, go to the show notes. This is a really interesting pod. We hadn't exactly intended for it to go this long, but 
I am stoked that it did because having this opportunity to have someone so knowledgeable, who's also an educator and can deliver this information so efficiently and articulately was a treat. And I'm very excited to share it with you. So if you're interested in learning more about storytelling, screenplays, novelizations, the hero's journey, I invite you to join Jacobo de la Quercia and myself in part one of his preface. All right, and I'm here with Jacobo de la Quercia. Jacobo, how are you doing today? Very well, sir, how are you doing? Always awesome, thanks for asking. So. There is a ton I'd like to cover, and we've already talked a bunch even before I hit that big red record button. Really excited to have this conversation with, uh, with you, and we've actually spoken to, together in a previous panel for Write Hive, which is an online writers conference I'd recommend people check out. That's a yearly thing. But for people who didn't have a chance to check out the detailed introduction at the top, could you just let people know about yourself, credentials, publications, all that kind of good stuff? Uh, certainly. My name is, um, well, first of all, my name is actually Giacomo. It's not Jacopo. Uh, I am a, a novelist and a writer, educator. I've been um, a lecturer with um, Humanities New York, which is the New York State branch of the National Endowment for the Humanities, for about eight years. And um, I've been offering classes up and around upstate New York on various aspects of the humanities, history, literature, uh, military science, fine art, even offered a little bit on medical history, which I really enjoyed. I'm the author of uh, two books. Well, actually, I'm the author of two books, uh, the co-author of a play, and also I'm working on my first ever YA novel, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, my writing has always been designed to be both educational and entertaining. Specifically, I really wanted my writing to serve as an introduction for many readers to otherwise esoteric aspects of history and research that may have been foreign to them. So essentially, um, history is a sandbox that I play in. I create all these stories. And in the process, I try to make every single grain of sand a little bit more interesting and hopefully the beginning of some subsequent research for anyone who's kind enough to enjoy it with me. But I'm here, happy to talk about, um, from the sound of it, I'll be talking about my second novel, License to Quill which is a James Bond-esque spy thriller starring William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe during the Elizabethan Golden Age, uh, specifically the Jacobin period, I should say. That, along with my first novel, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, are the sum of lots of research, a love of cinema and entertainment, and also, as mentioned, an opportunity for people to learn a lot more about not only these time periods in history, but some of the fascinating real men and women that lived through it. So thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here and uh, happy to dissect whatever you want when it comes to my works or other works when it comes to the monomyth popularized by Joseph Campbell in his book, Hero with a Thousand Faces. There's so much to discuss. I've been looking forward to this for a while. And like with my previous guests, Zamal Akhtar, you were one of the first people I thought of when I started the podcast, thinking, got to get this guy on the pod. So thanks again for joining me. And uh, let's get right to your preface. All right. So we enter the old world, Jacopo. Prior to writing, were you fulfilled in life? Did you feel like something was missing, creatively speaking, or were you good where you were? Well, honestly, when it came to writing, and um, you could ask friends of mine, people I went to high school with, college with, I never really set out to become a writer. And it was also something where I didn't think I was actually very good at being a writer. I always imagined, like, I was surrounded by people who were not only very gifted storytellers during their own time period, but were actually creating like zines and short stories and sketches and script, like, you know, like screenplays that they wrote in high school that they were dedicating their time to, I really enjoyed being a part of the audience rather than actually being part of the creative process. But when I was in college, I was, I was told by several professors that um, the way that I was writing my essays was very narrative. And I was actually encouraged to go into the creative, uh, creative arts. And even though I wasn't majoring in any of that, um, in fact, I think yeah, I've only actually ever had one class 
after high school when it comes to writing. And that was a core level class on creative writing at Susquehanna University with a very nice professor, Dr. Lawrence Beeson, who I'm still friends with. Uh, he was the first professor that really encouraged me to become a writer. He actually invited me to tea one time and essentially very passionately urged me to not become a lawyer and to become a writer instead. <laughs> I turned him down, but um, about 10 years later, once I was creating, um, once my first novel was finished, I was able to track him down. He's in a different state at that time. And um, I credited him for encouraging me to do this. He was very grateful. We're still in touch with each other every now and then. Uh, the truth is, when it came to fulfillment, I had two main passions that I wanted to be doing something with. I was studying history and political science. It looks like someone accurately assumed that I would have difficulty finding employment in the future and also doing something I would like with myself in the future. If I was only dedicated to one subject, if I was just focusing on history or just focusing on political science. So I used Niccolo Machiavelli as the link to hold those two passions together, specifically uh, my interest in the Italian Renaissance, which is a passion of mine I've had since I was six years old. My mother explained to me that the Ninja Turtles were actually not just turtles, they were people, and they created some of the most beautiful, most valuable artwork in history. That was the beginning of me having an appreciation not only for the Italian Renaissance, but the literal treasure of history that was lurking beneath the surface of some of our favorite stories. With that in mind, when it came to me being encouraged by numerous professors, I should say, uh, I studied abroad in Florence during my junior year. Again, I had a professor, uh, Dr. Sarah Matthews Greco. She was a professor of, um, I believe it was, I think she was a professor of uh, women's history and sexuality, uh, sexuality over at Syracuse University in Florence. She also passionately encouraged me to be writing history. I remember I had um, another professor, uh, actually an Italian professor while I was there. Uh, she, my final handshake with her, my final conversation in person, she said, I look forward to reading books by you. Mm. At that point, I really felt like um, I owed it to these professors to at least dabble in some way with creative writing. So I started doing that when I was out of college. I had a project that became my first novel. It's never going to be published because, in my opinion, that book is not a book that needs to be published. I mean, I'll be very frank about it. It was based on the life of Dante Alighieri, and it was essentially a workshop where I taught myself how to write a novel. And after that, I worked for the Obama presidential campaign in 2008. That actually gave me an excellent background when it came to being able to manage very difficult uh, challenges and schedules, timelines, etc. And in addition to that, I was teaching off and on at a local community college, Bucks County Community College. I was teaching adult education courses, almost all of the night courses on um, Renaissance history, Renaissance literature. And as I said, when it came to Machiavelli, I was going back and forth, back and forth between history and politics, both professionally and in my own creative interests. And eventually, um, I even taught a few classes on Machiavelli himself uh, after I finished my work over with the Obama campaign. But ultimately, um, it's not so much that there was a lack of fulfillment. And I, from, I want to be very clear. I have heard from people that I know and um, respect very much that have met him that said Dan Brown is actually much more intelligent than some of his writing may suggest, by which I mean... Uh, when it comes to the Da Vinci Code, which was immensely popular when I was in college, it's sort of like a, that's a popcorn movie. It's not a documentary. And um, that there's a lot more, that he had a lot more understanding and appreciation for history than was being conveyed in his novels. And I remember when Assassin's Creed 2 came out, a whole bunch of people loved that. Yeah. The whole idea of having an action movie, so to speak, action adventure game set in the Italian Renaissance so many people were very excited about that. I was intrigued. I honestly liked the recreation of the cities more than the storyline because as I was, um, it's worth mentioning, I've never even played the game. Ezio Auditore, he was great. Well, no, no, hear me out. I was watching, I couldn't afford the systems at oh. the time. I was watching the game movies from YouTube channels like Gamer's Little Playhouse, which I guess is a good way of approaching, you know, a good way of judging a video game as a form of entertainment media. Is it on its own 
able to suffice as a good story. I actually think one of the best examples of that is the game Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Classic. That video game changed that. I'm, I'm actually very serious when I say this. I might not have become a writer if it wasn't for that video game, because that was the first time not only I played a video game that, in my opinion, had a story that was better than certain movies I had seen, but it was the first time that I really appreciated the power that the narrator has in a story. Not to spoil it for anyone, but um, uh, Prince of Persia's Sands of Time, it's basically Disney's Aladdin meets The Matrix. It's a very interesting story, brilliantly told, uh, one of the best games from its generation, uh, highly recommended to anyone, made an absolutely terrible film. Jake Gyllenhaal. There, you know what really disappointed me about that? A, a very good friend of mine that I met in 2008 during the Obama campaign, she was a very dear friend. She worked at the State Department. She said, there are so many amazing Persian actors and actresses out there. Yes. That would have loved the opportunity to be in a big budget film as the Prince of Persia, doing parkour, doing their own stunts, all that kind of stuff, and um, such a lost opportunity. And I'm going to be honest, I thought the screenplay, the script that they had, the in-game script for that game was pretty good. I, I see no reason why they can't just be faithful to that when it comes to adapting it, be it animated or live action. Anyways, to bring this all back full circle, the reason why I was mentioning Dan Brown, the reason why I was mentioning that, um, what was it, The Da Vinci Code, is there was a lot, and Assassin's Creed, is there was a lot of history-based entertainment media that was becoming very popular, but I felt that they were missing out on a lot of fascinating history that could have been more prominent. When I was watching the first um, Assassin's Creed, uh, or when, sorry, when I was watching a video playthrough, and, uh, basically a game movie of Assassin's Creed 2, the whole time I was thinking, where's Cesare Borgia? Like, he needs to be in here. Like, he's the perfect person to be, uh, you know, like an equal-footed opponent to Ezio Arditore. And, of course, he's in the uh, expansion. He's in the Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. And that's one thing that really, really irritates me with so much entertainment today, that the show must go on. Not for the sake of storytelling, but for the sake of capitalism, consumerism, profits, etc. It's one of the reasons why I'm actually not really a fan of many television programs nowadays, because there's so many wonderful, wonderful television programs that become a show, by which I mean is it's no longer a story that's being presented on television. It is now a entertainment property on television that exists solely for the purpose of staying on television for as long as possible. Yeah, I think the um, ironically named The Walking Dead series that refused to end went from an excellent premise with the graphic novels to an abomination. I feel so bad for Frank Darabont. I mean, I cannot think of any, he probably had the greatest directorial debut since Citizen Kane. Yeah, that's an amazing pilot. I know the pilot was incredibly good and I just feel so bad for this guy. He wrote an Indiana Jones that was not made. He created the walking dead and it was just as quickly taken away from him. He, he created um, what the number one highest rated film on IMDb.com, the Shawshank Redemption. I mean, he's such an incredibly talented filmmaker. He has a wonderful eye. He's actually a very old fashioned filmmaker as well. He's a filmmaker who, in my opinion, his films would not have, in my opinion, been that foreign if they had been aired in the 1940s or 50s. Mm -hmm. And it's not that that's a sign of superiority as a filmmaker, but I think it's a good sign of versatility that somebody today would have still been successful doing just what they're doing 100 years ago or 80 years ago. He's a wonderfully, wonderfully talented person. And uh, it is a shame that when it comes to The Walking Dead that he was not part of that process for much longer. It's... It, there's nothing like a really good pilot mm -hmm. when it comes to a television show. Breaking Bad had a pilot that could have been its own movie. It was so good. But anyway, but what I am getting at is when I when I was saying that is I'm not interested in writing books or telling stories for the purpose of it selling very well or for the purpose of it being repackaged again and again. Rather, I wanted to tell stories that I wanted to see more of, but that didn't exist. And entertainment. I wanted to write a historical fiction that was loaded with footnotes so that people could see this actually happened, that actually happened. 
I wanted to tell the craziest stories that I could that with some stretch of the imagination could have actually happened. Also, as speaking as someone such as yourself, you know that there's just, that history is just this complicated ocean. Every single drop is a different person that contributed to it, made it larger, made it more wild. There's fascinating stories out there that nobody knows about, that very few people know about. And I wanted to familiarize people not only with some of these fascinating stories from history that don't get a lot of attention, but I wanted to familiarize them with the resources that I use to find them and research them and present them in these books so that my audience could not only immerse themselves into history, as if history is this great expanded universe that my novels are a part of, but so that they could also research this, become familiar with it, possibly make discoveries of their own and feature that in any works of fiction or nonfiction that they're a part of. One thing I want to add before I go forward is, speaking of Assassin's Creed with the city design in two, Assassin's Creed Unity, which takes place during the reign of terror, the French Revolution, or at least that portion of it, Paris is, it is a character unto itself. It is stunning. So if you ever just want to look at footage of people playing at the parkour is arguably the best it's ever been in the series. They had a woman who spent two years just recreating the the cathedral, uh, the Notre Dame from the ground up, every single thing. I've seen a video on her and actually, uh, I believe it was the chief uh, historian for that video game. He actually provided a blurb for my first novel, oh, cool. The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy. So I, I will say, Assassin's Creed, the series, it actually has gotten a lot better when it comes to attention to detail with history and also when it comes to using the video games as a classroom, so to speak. I, I believe it was Assassin's Creed Origins that they literally have virtual tours mm -hmm. in the game that you could go on when it comes to ancient Egypt. Yeah, and a pretty cool depiction of the Peloponnesian Wars as well. Oh yeah, yeah, I actually need to play that one, I never have. I, I do have one problem with it though, and that is, um, and, and I'm gonna be like full disclosure, when it comes to the Assassin's Creed games that I've actually played, that I've beaten from beginning to end. Uh, I played and beaten Assassin's Creed Black Flag and Assassin's Creed Rogue. Both of them were really good, but I also had problems with them. First of all, Ubisoft needs to retire. They need to retire the A plot of these games, which is which you are working in a company surrounded by a, a bunch of dude bro bullies. I actually am so irritated with that in all of their games. They did not need to anchor their games in the real world for people to be interested in it. Mm -hmm. They did not need to. And for whatever reason, I don't even know if they have retired that part of the story. If they have, interrupt me. And I'll say thank you. Oh, no, it's still going on. Oh, why in the world? There's a lot that Ubisoft needs to retire, including just the kind of checkpoint, finding all the little collectibles aspect. I think for the completionists, that's very gratifying. But for the majority of us, it's just a, it's a chore. Yeah, I know. And, and, and anyways, what I'm saying is the A plot they need to retire. Make the B plot the part that's actually packaged on the box. Make that the A plot. Forget that the other thing even happened. Allow people to entertain the fact that they are playing a game set in history, rather than remind them again and again that you are playing a game that was made by a company identical to Ubisoft. Yeah. The other gripe that I have is just, um, and like I said, I don't know if this is a product of its time, but um, the games, uh, two things. One, the writing is really 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 irritating yeah just all the men are such bullying jerks there's so few women in them i mean jesus the what is it connor's wife in assassin's creed black flag like she just dies off camera yeah I, and we don't even know about it unless we stick around for the 45 minutes in the end credits <laughs> to find out oh yeah his wife is dead yeah that sucks it, it's just terrible story writing but there there's one other thing though i wanted to say i actually really enjoyed assassin's creed rogue i thought the story was good it was a good evolution of the story uh, it was a good evolution of the mythos when it came to the assassins possibly becoming villains i mean did they ever wonder that maybe part of the reason a lot of people don't like them is because they're called assassins like it'd be like there's a secret society called the traitors or the backstabbers and they're like, why don't people understand us? We are, you know, we are good people. Like we were trying to save Rome when we backstabbed Julius Caesar. Yeah, it's all about marketing. Yeah, I know. But this, I just wanted to wrap it up. When it came to Assassin's Creed um, 
road, which again, I did enjoy, especially being someone who lives in upstate New York. You cannot go back and forth between having beautifully recreated detailed worlds and cathedrals and cities, and then go to a fictional map of the United States where basically Albany, New York is in the same bayou as Mount Vernon, Virginia. What the hell was that about? Yeah, it's a travesty. And I think with a, one of the funny things when you play an Assassin's Creed game, if you know anything about geography and or geopolitics of that time period, if you can contextualize any of it, it is just the sheer number of flubs and artistic liberties, which of course it's an Assassin's Creed game. You have to expect that. But some of them to the point where it is me face palming so hard, my eyes explode out the back of my head. It is just stunning flubs. But one thing I wanted to get to, you mentioned A plot, a plot and B plot. Could you explain the A plot and B plot and then dovetail that into License to Quill, what that's about? Because I think that's very relevant what the external conflict is in that story and what the internal is. Could you talk about A and B plot and then how that ties to License to Quill? Uh, absolutely. So um, when it comes to A plots and B plots and... Um, if I'm not mistaken, I first heard the term referred to when it comes to sitcom writing, specifically by the Simpsons uh, writers and their director commentaries. So I do not know if it originated when it comes to sitcoms, or by, uh, by which I mean like American sitcoms in the 1990s and onward, but it is probably one of the best examples of it. The A plot is a little bit like um, the top billing story. It's almost always... Uh, related to the title is the primary narrative that you are focusing. The B plot is what else is going on at the same time. Uh, for example, Marge versus the monorail. A lot of people love that written by Conan O'Brien considered one of the funniest Simpsons uh, episodes of all time. So the A plot is Marge versus the monorail. It's actually about Marge Simpson having this problem with this monorail is being opened and operated and ultimately it's uh, a huge confidence scam created by, um, you know, this mystery man that comes in, modeled after the music man from the, uh, the famous Broadway musical. So that's the A plot. The B plot is actually what else is going on. And so the B plot is that Homer, for whatever reason, gets a job as a monorail conductor. Oh, yeah, because it was his lifelong dream. In addition to eating the world's largest sandwich, in addition to streaking nude on uh, the World yeah. Series, in addition to being on the Gong Show, like um, that's the B plot. The B plot is usually not as essential, usually not as consequential. I mean, it can be, of course. A good story will tie them all together, but ultimately, um, that's the breakdown with the A plot, the A plot, and the B plot. Um, of course, Seinfeld did that quite a lot. If you watch Futurama, they did that as well. It's very conducive if you're having a sitcom that has a large cast of main characters, including characters that are sometimes more interesting than the main title character, Seinfeld, for example. But when it comes to License to Quill, which was very different than my first novel. Uh, so just to, just to provide the backstory, when I wrote my first novel, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pockwash Conspiracy, my main character was William Howard Taft. I picked him for two reasons. One, because I assumed that many readers like myself, when I started, didn't know anything about him, which offers me a whole lot of creative liberty when it comes to the character. Uh, at the same time, I decided to actually have the Great Abraham Lincoln Pockwash Conspiracy serve as a little bit of a case study example when it comes to the four personality types related to humorism in ancient Greek medicine. So um, when it comes to the four main characters in that story, William Howard Taft, Chief Wilkie, Robert Todd Lincoln, and Major Archibald Butt. Each one of them was essentially a Ninja Turtle. Each one of them was a Power Ranger. Each one of them was representing one of these four aspects of personality types that much like the hero's journey has existed for so long in Western literature. That said, I had a single main character, William Howard Taft, who went on a proper hero's journey from beginning to end, which I want to say I did not actually intend to have him model the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell. It wasn't until after I wrote it that I found this fantastic visual that I shared with you when it comes to the 17 stages of Joseph Campbell's monument. Which is so cool. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that, that was wonderful and great discovery and um, coincidentally a nice little 
a nice little confirmation that I was on to something with some of the beats in the story, which I want to be honest, I was just trying to model that after my understanding of cinema and what I felt was the natural fluidity when it comes to storytelling. If the Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy is more like Raiders of the Lost Ark, let's say, License to Quill is more like Godfather too, because I had here parallel storylines going on at the same time, an A plot and a B plot and an A character and a B character. Uh, specifically, the A plot for License to Quill but where it comes to the title, it's a little bit ambiguous in the sense that we actually have more than one character who's referred to in universe. And this was approved by EON Productions, Everything or Nothing Productions that owns the James Bond properties. We are allowed to refer to our secret agents as double O agents, as long as we explain what the double O was, which was the Office of Ordnance, which during this time they would abbreviate as OO in writing to save on ink and which was expensive back then. Uh, also, as long as we did not have any flash forwards to the present day, as long as we did that, it was very clear that these secret agents, which were given technology specially equipped for the English government and military's disposal at the office of ordinance, which is where it would have been designed and where they had the powers to be doing that under uh, Henry VIII and afterwards, that we could refer to them as double O agents legally. And license to quill. We're basically following two of those agents, one of each O, if you want to look at it that way. Actually, that's lame. I'm just being cute when I say that. <laughs> uh, the A plot is William Shakespeare um, being recruited by Guy Fawkes and these conspirators to write a play that eventually becomes Macbeth. Macbeth is the MacGuffin in the story. It's what ultimately brings the main character into this adventure. It's something that a lot of people have little, they have great difficulty getting their hands on it, but then once they actually have it, it doesn't actually do much. And I'm also a big fan of the MacGuffin having some sort of monetary value in the sense that I like MacGuffins where someone who has no idea what it is could still take it to a pawn shop and get a whole lot of money for it. By which I mean, I mean, when it comes to the pocket watch conspiracy, the, uh, the MacGuffin is this gold watch that for some reason does not need to be wound, but it doesn't work and it's a magnificent watch. You could take that to a jewelry shop or a pawn shop at the time period and you could have gotten a lot of money from it. It could have disappeared from all knowledge. And when it comes to License to Quill, the MacGuffin is essentially the first ever draft, original draft from Shakespeare's hand of Macbeth. That'd be worth millions of dollars today if someone can get their hands on it. Nevertheless, at the time period, it's worth a few pieces of silver and gold. It does have a value and also there's a lot of plagiarism going on at the time period so even within the theater circles it has a value anyway that's the a plot that's the part where we have the character who's with us for the entire story seeking out and creating and ultimately using and misusing the MacGuffin. and when it comes to the b plot we follow the late christopher marlowe who in real life was accidentally stabbed to death in the eye and disappeared from history, by which I mean he disappeared because he was dead. And so what I did was I did a lot of research and I was able to piece together the right people and the right scenarios that showed that he did not actually die in that encounter. He was rather put into forced retirement. And his B-plot follows him in Venice. I actually never say this in the book, but he does. Actually, I hint upon this, but I never outright say it. His day job in Venice is he works for the, uh, essentially the, for lack of better terms, the Library of Congress of the Venetian Republic. That's the reason why he's able to get so many important documents and hand them off to the British government. What he's actually doing, and he doesn't know it, is he's basically on ice. He is in forced retirement. This one character called the Dragoman, who is a double O agent, he's essentially his handler keeping an eye on him, reactivating him if the need comes. And coffee supplier. Oh, yeah. Uh, essentially, um, he gets Christopher Marlowe addicted to coffee, which he's never had before, and essentially is using that as a way of keeping a leash on him. It's, uh, it's terrible, but I actually based that a little bit on uh, friends of mine, unfortunately, who suffered from substance abuse and some of the methods that have been used of weaning people off of it, like swapping addiction, so to speak. Hmm. But yeah, when it comes to Christopher Marlowe, I will say um, the hero's journey that the two of them go on, they, uh, Marlowe does go on a journey as well. He is reborn 
he literally, he goes through um, apotheosis. He's able to get back all of his strength and become a greater, um, you know, become a greater double illusion than he ever was. There is one thing that I found interesting, though. I found that a character like James Bond is too unrealistic for one person to have all those abilities. So I actually wrote these two main characters, William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, as the two of them having the combined talents of James Bond, but individually had different aspects of them. Marlowe is perfectly suited to be a James Bond when it comes to the womanizing and the drinking and the things that should have gotten him killed a dozen times and he somehow survives. He's also basically a polymath. He's incredibly intelligent and true to history. But at the same time, when it comes to William Shakespeare, he's someone who has the level-headedness that's necessary in order to actually have a public face for what he's doing, to meet and have negotiations. His main skill is he's a fantastic actor. Like many people overlook that Shakespeare performed in his own plays at the time, that was actually considered uh, improper. They felt that directors were meant to be behind the scenes and actors were really just supposed to read their lines and that's it. He wrote and starred in his work, which was unusual at the time. He was someone who was able to do two things. One, and this is very simple. I don't know if this is true about Shakespeare. I'm just assuming as an actor, he'd be able to spot a liar. But something else that I did is that um, when it came to Shakespeare, He's able to spot a liar, but I wanted to highlight this one very important aspect. When it comes to all the documentaries I watched about Shakespeare, when it came to commentaries on him for the past few hundred years, it seemed that the main narrative with Shakespeare, it, his greatest contribution to literature in general, not English literature, literature in general, is that he was the first truly great storyteller in modern history, not in ancient history. He was the first truly great storyteller who was able to empathize with villains. I think Macbeth is a great example of that. Exactly. He's able, to, he's able to have people understand why they are doing this. It's not simply because they're evil. He has some people that are just plain evil in his stories. But he's letting you know that there is more of a motive for them to be doing this than simply to be an antagonist in the storyline. So that was one of the reasons why... Um, with that A plot, which is appropriate for an A plot, we see Shakespeare going into the real dangerous scenarios where he's surrounded by criminals and where he's playing a part in this real life plot to overthrow the English government. And it's worth mentioning that um, a lot of the history that I drop in when it comes to Shakespeare and the um, players, their role in the Earl of Essex affair, that was very true where Shakespeare and his crew, uh, they were recruited under the late reign of Queen Elizabeth I to do a one night only production of Richard II, I believe it was, even though it was an older play, it was out of season, and they had to perform it for one night only with a scene that had been previously censored by the British government that involved, um, I believe it was two men fighting over a crown. They performed it, they received some extra money for it, and uh, the, Earl of Essex, the Earl of Essex staged a coup d'etat the next day. So it looks like that Shakespeare's actors were being used, knowingly or unknowingly, to be a part of a coup d'etat attempt. I guess the equivalent today would be if you like, seized control of a major network for like one day before you were to launch something like the January 6th attack. Well, that's kind of similar to V for Vendetta, the film at least, where they oh, very much uh, so. do something similar. And then it's a Guy Fox mask. So I, I will admit, when it came to V for Vendetta, uh, when I was writing this, uh, V for Vendetta actually played one of the earliest roles when it came to my idea for License to Quill. Because I did not plan on writing that book until about one month before I put together the proposal. I had just finished, and I mean just finished, the pocket watch conspiracy. I handed it off. My editor said, we really liked it. Can you come up with something else? I spoke to my agent at the time. I hammered together a few ideas, I think two or three of them. But I ultimately realized License to Quill was probably the best out of all of them. One of the things that motivated me is I just remembered several years ago. No, no, now I remember. As I was putting together a story involving the gunpowder plot, like I said, because um, I knew that I wanted to do something else that involved a big conspiracy after the pocket watch conspiracy. And I just went on YouTube and I was watching the opening flashback 
in V for Vendetta, which takes place during the hanging of Guy Fawkes. And I was watching it and I was just thinking, checking the years, shouldn't William Shakespeare be in that crowd? And I was like, well, what the hell happened while Fox was being hung and Shakespeare, you know, was alive during this time. And, and I had already known for a long time about Macbeth. It's my favorite play, I performed it when I was in sixth grade. And it was something that I'd spent a lot of time researching and understanding and appreciating. And once I learned that Macbeth itself was written either during or immediately after the Guy Fox plot, and once I learned more about how basically this was a Gestapo-esque police state, that this was the golden age of English espionage, this is where it all began, all the secret codes, all the spies versus spies, all the cloak and dagger stuff, and that Christopher Marlowe likely was a spy during all this. So that's where I just got all the real history, threw it all in there, and almost like wheels in a clock, I, like, I wove my narrative through the teeth to make all the history and the fiction seem like a well-synchronized machine. How easily did all that snap together? Because I'm doing something similar and it's just, like you've said, it's kind of like clockwork. All the gears have snapped together. Did you realize during the gunpowder plot, authoritarian England, the persecution of Catholics, all kinds of stuff by Protestants, did that just kind of happen all at once? Was it pretty organic? Uh, yeah, with both of my novels, including what I'm writing right now and what I've written uh, before, this is not universal when it comes to publishing, but at least with my experience in publishing from when I first started with the pocket watch conspiracy, uh, I was told that you have to have a two to 10 page synopsis of your entire book. Like this is once you're in the negotiation stage. If someone is interested in seeing more than like a two page synopsis, like you have like a one or two page pitch where you're selling your idea for the book. And then it's um, a larger two to 10 page document where you provide almost beat by beat the entire story, uh, I would I would equate it to like a Wikipedia entry, like a good Wikipedia entry to a film that covers all the broad strokes. So when it came to both of my novels, I wrote uh, the synopses for them. I guess you could call them the stories after about one month of research. And uh, the final product, even though it would take a year or a year and a half for me to finish both of them, the main product almost always followed those broad strokes. The only things that would change is the minor details. So like, for example, uh, I would like to say Shakespeare is recruited by Guy Fawkes to write Macbeth. I didn't know how or why he was going to be recruited. That would be the product of a whole lot of research. And so that's where I would put together my motives, my personalities, what the dialogue would be like, the conversations. Like Shakespeare and uh, Guy Fawkes, they're actually, he, like Guy Fawkes is sort of a shadow self when it comes to Shakespeare. A lot of people view uh, Christopher Marlowe as sort of like Shakespeare's uh, shadow self, if they're going to be using a Joseph Campbell example, but they're not. They're actually both the main characters in the story following parallel stories. When it comes to Shakespeare having an opponent and someone who could probably be Shakespeare, if Shakespeare chooses to, uh, choose to be that way, that's Guy Fawkes. They're literally seated on equal tables. They're literally both armed under the table at the same time. They're both liars, professional liars, only different types of it. And of course, during my research, when it came to gray areas where we don't know for sure if it's true, like there was a question, is, was Shakespeare a covert Catholic? Had he converted? That kind of stuff. Well, that's where I get this nebulous area of history and I make a decision to go in this one direction. I decide, yes, Shakespeare was, past tense, a covert Catholic. We're going with that. I then did more research and found out Christopher Marlowe was a Catholic uh, when he was recruited. I later found out, and I, I think I did mention this in License to Quill, one of the biggest secrets when it comes to espionage, and this is one thing that, um, not going into too much detail, I can say this is still used today. One of the biggest secrets in espionage is that spies don't know that they're expendable. <laughs> An excellent secret is that there's actually quite a lot of people like James Bond who will take James Bond's place. Like they mentioned they mentioned that a little bit in the old like Goldfinger or something like, you know, like you kill me, someone else will replace me. <laughs> like when it comes to license to quill though, there's a reason why Thomas Walsingham, the spy master, is using people like Christopher Marlowe and people like William Shakespeare. They're Catholic kids in Protestant England. Who the hell cares if they get killed? Right. And that's the Cold War mentality that I came to appreciate that I was like, oh, I understand. So it's still East and West in its own way. 
only instead of it being communists and capitalists, it's Catholics and Protestants. And because this actually was a real life Cold War going on at the time period, that's all the trappings and the details that I did not anticipate at the time, but was the best possible background I could have to make this historical fiction seem like a James Bond story. I'll just put a nightcap on it and say that I always appreciated the hero's journey. I just didn't know what it was until I was in my 20s. I'm a product of the late 1980s. Uh, there was a great appreciation of historical fiction during this time period. There was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. There was Back to the Future. There was Indiana Jones. All these stories where history was the playground, so to speak. History was the exotic location, the undiscovered continent, the forbidden island. It was the bottom of the sea. It was the surface of the moon. Because I'd enjoyed so much of that, I actually had always, I mean, of course, Star Wars as well. I had always been viewing so many of my favorite stories, and as I got older, appreciating their similarities. That itself was the hero's journey that, at least for the Pocket Watch Conspiracy, served as my understanding of the beats and the pacing per story. When there should be a low point, when there should be like a near-death experience, when uh, you know there should be a huge climax, all that kind of stuff. So that was an influence for me, even though it was much more subconscious the first time I went around. When it comes to what I'm writing right now, on the other hand, I've been like watching all the video essays, like literally having a map, planning it. I, I will say for the Pogwash Conspiracy, though, my primary motivation was not so much the hero's journey. It was primarily the four different personality types. Hmm. I mean, when it comes to the four of them, there's a reason why, you know, President Taft is always drinking champagne. There's a reason why Wilkie is always drinking explosive whiskey. There's a reason why Robert Tom Lincoln is drinking tea. And there's a reason why Major Butt is always drinking water. Those are their elements, classically. That's a, those are the personality types. Those are their elements. Like Taft, he's jovial, he's childlike. His atmosphere is air. He's more at home on an airship than he is at the White House. In real life, Taft didn't like the White House in the sense that once he was out of, once he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he said, I'm having so much fun in my life right now, I don't even remember being president. <laughs> Dude, no, I'm serious, that, that was William Howard Taft in real life. And so um, elements like that in the hero's journey that um, influenced my storyline, like I said, that was really just me really being a student of incredibly talented storytellers since early in my life. Yaku, but was there a book author? We've talked about some really cool stuff that's influenced you in terms of uh, professors, for example. Other pivotal events or people that inspired you to write? Every book that I've written is the product of entire libraries of researchers. No matter what book I'm writing, I'm going to have acknowledgments that are going to be crediting, crediting every single person that played some role in the creation of the book. Uh, these people have dedicated their entire lives just to understanding this single map of a little known part of England from 400 years ago that have dedicated their entire lives to appreciating this little known person from history. Uh, these, are the, these are the bedrock that I am mining as my quarry for my books. I could not do it without them. It's, so it's too many of them for me to list right now. It's just they are the recommended texts that I have at the end. They are the biggest inspiration in terms of people playing a role in creating the story. Uh, when it comes to other things, though, even some of those same people, if you spend 50 years of your life learning a lot about one or two or 10 people from history, you tend to know some interesting things about them that not a lot of people know about. So when it came to a, a very dear friend of mine, Mark Wortman, he was a journal, well, he is a writer and a journalist. He still has books coming out. Please look up his work. Um, he wrote a great book called 1941, Fighting the Shadow War. He has a magnificent understanding of the fact and the fictions when it comes to espionage and uh, secret societies. He was the guy who exposed the story that Yale University Skull and Bones tomb had the skull of Geronimo. Hmm. Yeah, he was the one who broke that story for officially for Vanity Fair. So in the pocket watch conspiracy, I was going to have a scene that takes place in the Skull and Bones tomb. Now, again, that was me putting it in a premise because I thought it would sound kind of cool. I didn't know how the hell I was going to do it, though, <laughs> let alone make it believable and entertaining. I mean, it's like 
instead of extracting a tooth, I was like trying to put a tooth into a jaw where I didn't even know if there would be space for it. <laughs> but it turns out he had actually interviewed Bonesman and um, we lived nearby to each other. So we both met at New Haven in Yale University. He walked me around, he showed me some of the areas, he answered every question I had. And there was a moment where he took me to um, Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. And he just said, as I'm there, he said, this would be a good place for a car chase. <laughs> and I looked and he was right. He was very damn right. All the headstones were roughly the same height. They could offer lots of physical cover. A car could be zooming through there. You could see the cars without them being obscured from the tombstones. But at the same time, it, I, he was right in every single direction, at every single point of the compass. It was a great location for a car chase. So I put one in there. There's another time where um, uh, there's a, a scene in the Pocket Conspiracy where um, I knew that J.P. Morgan was going to be playing a role in there because, you know, he's got that, that nose of his. He looks like a James Bond villain. So I wanted to have him in there. And a friend of mine, and I want to do an impression of him because this is honestly how I think about him. If I just said he recommended this to me in his own voice, it would be doing a disservice. He's like, oh, yo, J.P. Morgan's going to be in your book. You gotta have the J.P. Morgan Library in there. It's awesome, man. So it, it plays a prominent role in the story. And I do want to say though, the driver who takes um, the Attorney General uh, Wickersham and um, Chief Wilkie, the person who drives them over to the J.P. Morgan Library, they mistake his name. Like uh, they go back and forth over his name is Frank, or if it's James, that is my friend James, whose real name is Frank that recommended that go in the story. He is one of the very, very, very few completely fictional characters in that book. That book has over 100 people either named or mentioned or with dialogue. Every one of them is a real person. Hmm. I'm not interested in having fictional characters. I like, try, like I said, I, I like getting the real people. I want history to be my entire expanded universe. So that every textbook that you're reading, every Wikipedia page that you're checking out is all part of my story. I love that. That's a great ethos. I mean, you can, I mean, La Storia, the definition of history is the stories. These are the greatest stories that we have. I don't want to compete against that. <laughs> so one of the things that I did want to talk about, and I've got my, let's see, got my copy of Hero with a Thousand Faces by Mr. Joseph Campbell. When we're talking inspiration, I guess you could say pretty much everybody, at least in Western literary history, has probably been influenced by Campbell, or at least his archetypes to some degree or another, from Gilgamesh to Heracles to Luke Skywalker, which segues into something you and I have discussed in back channels, which is the hero's journey, as well as how it relates to Star Wars, some of the earlier IPs and intellectual products and some of the later stuff. So I was hoping, because you are very knowledgeable in the monomyth. Could you break it down for us, whether you want to do the full-blown version like you did with Taft or the abbreviated version, however you like, obviously. What is the hero's journey, the monomyth, and how has that layered atop earlier Star Wars products as well as some of the later ones? Okay, so the hero's journey is essentially a thesis proposed by Joseph Campbell in um, his mid 20th century works that laid out uh, the idea that in most Western literature and most of the heroic Western literature, I should say, that many of these stories follow a similar structure when it comes to the journey of someone from starting in a very humble beginning, um, being given an opportunity to go on an adventure, refusing the call for adventure, being forced into it, they're not able to stay at home and thus going on a structure that we as an audience um, have come to view as very entertaining and very heroic, very aspirational, et cetera. It's very common in the Greek myths, and uh, it's also demonstrated in um, the heroic epics of both antiquity and post-antiquity. And this was something from my understanding of it that uh, George Lucas after he wrote his initial treatment of Star Wars in 1973, I think it was, that he revisited the works of Joseph Campbell, which he had studied while he was a student. And he essentially used that as a little bit of um, a blueprint for writing his second draft of Star Wars, which much more closely resembled what we have right now. When it comes to the film Star Wars 
episode four, A New Hope. I will say this, what Lucas did a very good job with, and I want to say the people behind the scenes as well when it came to Star Wars. Star Wars, what we love about it was the product of many different minds that just through incredible opportunity, we're all working together. I'm talking Marsha Lucas, the editor. I'm talking about all the special effects crews, the sound editors, the designers, the actors themselves. Even though Mark Hamill will hysterically say that the big thing he brought to Luke Skywalker was the haircut. <laughs> but ultimately, when it comes to the final product that was Star Wars, and its popularity and its legacy, um, Star Wars is probably the greatest classical myth that has been created in the last few hundred years. And I'd probably say, if we're viewing it as a sweeping narrative, it might be the greatest epic, so to speak, since Paradise Lost, possibly superior to it. And when it comes to worldwide appeal, it might be the most... Um, uh, it's not the most viewed film of all time. I've actually heard persuasive arguments that the most viewed movie of all time is actually the 1939 film, Gone with the Wind. Now, I screwed up, I screwed up. The 1939 film, Gone with the Wind, is the most popular film in history adjusted for inflation. It sold more movie tickets. The most viewed film, in terms of watching it at home or on television or in general, and again, this is speculation, it's not a scientific poll, but it does make sense. It's actually most likely The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I've heard the same. So many times on holidays, I think there was um, I think there was a lapse in the copyright that allowed it to be broadcast on television a lot. And even that goes on its own. Um, Dorothy goes on a, a hero's journey of her own as she's going through there. You know, meets magical guardian, given this magnificent boon goes through. You know, I mean, oh my God, like the journeys and trials that she goes through, the belly of the beast. It is a fantastic example of the hero's journey. Anyway, when it comes to Star Wars and when it comes to the, not only the huge franchise it's become, but actually the huge want for more when it came to Star Wars, it really seems to me that um, the original Star Wars film and the original Star Wars trilogy has really satisfied the public's interest in very sweeping dramas and heroic stories in a way that actually is not too dissimilar from what audiences in ancient Greece appreciated or in ancient Rome. There's a great book that came out a few years ago called Gods and Robots. The author, her name escapes me, but it came out a few years ago from Princeton University Press, and it goes into incredible detail about how much the Greeks enjoyed and consumed and created what we would now call science fiction. Hmm. I'm talking robots, I'm talking cyborgs, I'm talking flying machines, floating machines, all this kind of stuff. I mean, the story of Icarus is basically the story of a flying machine that went bad. Yeah, Daedalus's crazy invention that's ripped right out of sci-fi. Exactly. Uh, they talk about, uh, it goes into de detail about Talos mm -hmm. from Jason and the Argonauts, essentially being almost like a sentinel from X-Men, just this huge robotic creature. I, I need to find out right now because I need to give this author credit for, all right, gods and robots. Anyone listening, if you're interested in what the ancient Greeks would have thought of when it came to Star Wars or Star Trek, anything like that, it is gods and robots, myths, machines, and ancient dreams of technology by um, Adrienne Mayer. Uh, she's the author of a book called The Amazons. Uh, the first robot to walk the earth was a bronze giant called Talos. That's all you need for a description of that. Check that out. It gives you a wonderful understanding of how truly classic the whole genre of science fiction is. And anyways, the reason why I am mentioning that with respect to Star Wars is because the beats of a good story when it comes to using science fiction or not using uh, science fiction in primar primarily Western literature does follow this hero's journey, this arc. Uh, specifically, it's a ring in uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, image. And it's something that is very handy as an educator or even as a, a storyteller in conversations like this, because it is a film that can serve as an easy point of reference that we can use in conversation in order to understand um, who is a magical figure that's brought into a story at this certain piece. It's Obi-Wan in the beginning of Star Wars A New Hope. 
Uh, what exactly is it like when you're in the belly of the beast? Well, it's a lot like when this character Luke Skywalker is inside the Death Star, literally a huge planetoid made out of metal, this lifeless material. And when it comes to, you know, rescue from without, like, what is it like when a, a character is experiencing deus ex machina during the climactic battle? Just picture Luke, this farm boy who started off staring into the sunsets and ad admiring, like just imagining going on these adventures. And he's literally the sole survivor of this attack on this huge, horrifying weapon by himself. And he hears, use the force, Luke, with like the music swelling and all that it is. And again, again, I cannot give enough credit for it. Marsha Lucas's amazing editing when it comes to that whole film. She's the, uh, I, I actually have a coworker who worked at Lucasfilm and the, uh, I believe he was, I think he worked security at Skywalker Ranch. And he said that even after the divorce that um, Lucas and everyone in the company had so much respect for the editor, Marsha Lucas, that created that story and really rescued Star Wars from its current state, uh, its earlier cut of it. Yeah, I'd heard something about the, yeah, Lucas's writing needing a little bit of punching up. Well, there's nothing wrong with there's nothing wrong with being a fantastic storyteller if you are a fantastic storyteller whose work benefits from the input of other creative minds. Empire Strikes Back, I don't care what anyone says, Empire Strikes Back is the greatest Star Wars film. Like the greatest work of cinema in Star Wars is probably a, a new hope. If we're just talking like what it contributed to uh, world cinema in general, I'd say it's the first Star Wars. It's also probably um, I've observed as an uncle that it's the one Star Wars film that I've had an easy that I've had the easiest time watching and enjoying with very young children from beginning to end. Empire Strikes Back, though, that's the Star Wars film out of the first six that Lucas actually had the least amount of creative control over, in the sense that. He was not the director for it. He was not the shadow director for it. He had already, he had literally and knowingly outsourced a lot of that, that responsibility because of the anxiety he was going through when he came to the first Star Wars film. So, as I said, when you look at Empire Strikes Back and the, uh, the wonderful work that um, Irving Kirshner was able to do with that, and I do want to say the, um, if any of you have the DVD, the, I believe it was a 2004 DVD of um, the Star Wars trilogy, listen to the director of commentary from Irving Kirshner. I mean, he's an actual film professor. He uses The Empire Strikes Back as his case study on cinema. And he's such a wonderful narrator through it. And he has this, he has this wonderful voice, almost like he kind of sounds like Santa Claus talking to children as he's giving out every single gift in his bag. And it is, it's so wonderful, the approach that he used with Star Wars. Like he talks about how this universe that George Lucas created was Lucas's invention, and he didn't want to destroy it when it came to the sequel. So he said that rather than affect the universe itself, which I actually think um, uh, Richard Markham did a good job expanding the Star Wars universe when it came to aliens of different species joining the rebellions this real international look for the rebellion that was richard Marcan, and he doesn't get a lot of credit for it he's the person who got star wars and turned it from a very humanoid storyline into a galactic storyline because from what i understand he was doing that because he wanted re the rebellion to resemble the united nations during world war ii but anyways, when it came to Irving Kirshner, he said that he really wanted to focus on the characters themselves. And he felt like Star Wars has these great characters and he wanted to learn more about them aside from that hero's journey that they had gone on that in many cases had sort of concluded when it comes to a standalone film. And so that's why he gets the heroes that we love and we pull them apart from each other. You know, and we're they're constantly like, losing each other. It looks like Luke is about to die. It looks like R2-D2 is just swallowed by a monster. It looks like Han has been turned into a statue. And then he says, well, everyone is falling apart from each other in this movie. So what happens to C-3PO? Boom! He literally falls apart. <laughs> That's the wonderful, wonderful education that um, Irvin Kirshner offers, not only to um, The Empire Strikes Back, but of um, the opportunities in storytelling 
outside of that fully completed uh, story arc in Star Wars A New Hope. There's so much, I mean, we could talk and, and people have for literally thousands of hours at this point, probably more about the original Star Wars. And first off, yeah, Empire is the best, hands down. There's no argument there. I do want to say, Return, uh, can I just quickly say, Return of the Jedi is still pretty good. Oh, it's awesome. It's the most flawed of the three Star Wars films, but it's literally the bronze medal in one of the greatest trilogies in movie history. It is awesome in parts. I actually, I equate Return of the Jedi very much to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Hmm. In that it has a few, it has like a half an hour where it really doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, where they introduce some characters that are a little annoying. But when it, it starts really, really good with an excellent villain, and then it the last half hour of it is awesome 80s entertainment, some of the, like the best you'll ever see on uh, cinema. So I do want to say that Return of the Jedi does not get enough appreciation. It's actually... Return of the Jedi is a is a lot like Godfather 2 to me in the sense that Godfather 1, in my opinion, is the greatest American film ever made. And maybe I'm biased because I'm Italian-American. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm getting at is Godfather 1 is my favorite, but I love hearing people tell me why Godfather 2 is their favorite. Mm -hmm. I, I welcome the disagreement because I'm not interested in persuading them. I want to hear them persuade me into why this one aspect of the film that I might have overlooked deserves some more attention. And that's the approach that I really have when it comes to Return of the Jedi. I mean, it closes the trilogy story arc. Uh, again, Richard Marquand, he is the guy who hired Ian McDermott as Emperor Palpatine. So, and he's probably my single favorite Star Wars character out of all of them. He should be a terrible, in terms of execution, he should not work as a villain. He's so one-dimensional. He's just evil. He's a mustache tweezing baddie. I know that, but the great thing about him is he has something that is so lacking in Star Wars, and I'm including the original trilogy when I say this. He loves being himself. <laughs> he is an evil, one-dimensional character with no backstory, but he loves it. He's living his truth. I know, and and and, this, and I'm gonna say there's um there's a YouTube channel and a website called Collective Learning. It's run by a guy in Australia named uh, Rob Ager. He has a half an hour video essay that's just on Emperor Palpatine from Return of the Jedi. He spends close to the first 20 minutes just deconstructing when the Emperor says to Darth Vader, "Rise, my friend." He talks about how he walks with a cane, but then later when he's confronting Luke, he doesn't use a cane. Hmm. Uh, the fact that the Emperor Palpatine looks like corpse-like, he's so old, but he's played by a young actor, so he moves unnaturally youthfully. It's all these ways of actually confirming what Yoda said when he said, do not underestimate the powers of the Emperor. He doesn't need a cane. It's all show, it's ceremony. Even though he's like physically decrepit, he's the most powerful person in that room with this very young man and his incredibly powerful father. Wonderful breakdown in there, gives some fantastic background to that character, every single aspect of him, the lighting, the writing, the direction, the makeup. If there's any fans out there of Palpy, as I said, it's collativelearning.com. Check out that video essay just on the Emperor. As I said, Return of the Jedi is not my favorite Star Wars. It's my third favorite Star Wars, but it's the one that I, I want to hear a lot more appreciation for it. I want to, like it's the kind of thing where you learn so much more about not only what made Star Wars work, but how you can take big chances with Star Wars and still make it work. Return of the, like when it came to Emerald Akbar, he almost did not even make it into the film because behind the scenes they thought that people were going to be laughing when they saw that um, Mon Calamari, the Mon Cal. Exactly. The name, I will admit, the name Mon Cal is a little bit... It's a bit on the nose. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad they deleted a scene where we would have seen a B-Wing bomber, the cockpit. I love the B-Wings. They're my favorite. Oh, I love them too. And you know why they're not actually featured more prominently in Return of the Jedi? Hmm. Because they're so very thin, and when they were being shot against the blue screen, uh, it would almost like disappear. Oh, okay. So unless it was like a nice profile, yeah, it didn't really show up. Yeah, I know. We're lucky that we got as many clips of them as we did. But yeah, the B-Wing, it was supposed to be like um, the evolution of like the new Y-Wing, so to speak, the new heavy bomber. Yeah, you've probably seen the cutscene, or I'm sorry, you've probably seen the concept art of uh, 
a squadron of viewing bombers blowing the hell out of a, a star destroyer. Oh yeah. It looks like, yeah, there was supposed to be a more prominent use of them in the film and it was cut out for that one reason. But I actually maintain that uh, there's one part in Return of the Jedi, it's in the background when uh, Admiral Akbar says concentrate all fire on that super star destroyer, where you see a star destroyer seemingly fine and then it blows up in this huge mile long explosion. It's the only time in the entire trilogy where we see a regular Imperial Star Destroyer completely blow up. I actually think that was supposed to be the B-Wing attack oh. that they weren't able to film. So they just zoomed out, had it out of existence. I can't confirm that. I'm just speculating because uh, I've actually, I've done a little bit um, just completely independently as a fan appreciating the film. I've actually uh, spent a lot of time trying to better understand the movement of the fleets in Return of the Jedi. Because I actually realized the special effects crew, they did a very good job of, in this limited role that they played in the film, paying very good attention to not only lighting, but also the movement of the ships in this battle. And I eventually realized that um, it's pretty cool, sort of um, the storyboard they put together, or the order of battle, so to speak. The Star Destroyer, if you remember, when the Rebels show up, the Super Star Destroyer is like the only one you can really make up. The other Star Destroyers are just like, they're out there. You can kind of see them, but you can't see them as clearly as the Super Star Destroyer. Eventually, that Star Destroyer is literally really, really close to the Death Star. So what I actually think happened, and again, this is speculation, but this is the kind of speculation that these were decisions that the special effects crew really had to make in order to have a believability when it comes to where all of the ships are located. It looks like at some point during the Battle of Endor, how they scripted it, the entire Imperial fleet moved really, 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 really close to the Death Star. And what I think happened is when the Rebel fleet was engaging the Star Destroyers at point, at point break range, the Imperials, to deny them the advantage that offered, moved past them. Right. So they literally swapped sides. So you now had the Rebels basically sandwiching the Imperial fleet between the Death Star and between the Rebel Alliance. And doing something with that would make it harder for the Death Star to fire its weapons at the Rebel fleet. And not only that, that explains why later on in the Battle of Endor, when um, Lando Calrissian is saying, come on, hi, old buddy, like, uh, we need more time. We actually see the rear of all the Imperial fleet mm. at that point. We see the back engines over there. It looks like the Rebels had literally completely moved past the Imperial fleet. And again, that would explain why when the Death Star, I'm sorry, when the uh, Super Star Destroyer crashes into the Death Star, that it's already very, very close to it. Uh, keep in mind, keep in mind, by the time Return of the Jedi came around, those FX crews, they thought it was going to be the last film they ever make in the Star Wars universe. They knew it was going to be the greatest science fiction battle ever put on film. They put a lot of love into this final foray that they had when it came to the Star Wars trilogy. Like I said, Return of the Jedi will always deserve more appreciation. And I don't care what anybody says, it is very much in Luke Skywalker's character to ignite his lightsaber and kill everyone. Because that's what he does in Return of the Jedi. And it is freaking beautiful. So getting back to, you mentioned the disagreements between what's the best of the original Star Wars and... In tandem with that, we were talking about the hero's journey. And obviously, Star Wars has, some might argue, run away with itself. But um, I want to hear your thoughts on this. When we look at the hero's journey, according to Campbell, there was a series, um, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, that along with The Last Jedi, have some really different and, we'll say, interesting interpretations of the hero's journey. And I wanted to get your take because you and I were discussing this and well, I just want to hear what you have to say because I'm very intrigued. You're obviously very knowledgeable, uh, not only in the monomyth, but Star Wars as well. So why don't you tell us about the monomyth in regards to The Last Jedi and Obi-Wan Kenobi? So, well, all right, so let's start off with The Last Jedi since we're going chronologically. Uh, the Last Jedi and with the sequel trilogy had a big problem when it came to their hero's journey. And it wasn't simply that they were following up a story that already had a hero's journey for Luke that closed. And that they were going beyond the creative works of um, George Lucas. So there's one elephant in the room that I actually think was something that made it almost impossible 
to keep fans together when it came to Star Wars. Because at the end of the day, if there's one thing a Star Wars movie should do, it's something that should bring all the fans together. It's something that they should all enjoy and actually like seeing their rich universe populated with this. And that is they got what was the Star Wars sequels. That was the expanded universe. And they said that doesn't exist anymore. It's Legends. If you get any aspect of fandom, no matter what it is, I don't care if it's Star Wars, I don't care if it's Pogs, I don't care if it's Matchbox cars. If you take them away from the people who cherish them, they're going to naturally reject that. They're going to naturally, you know, be defensive. Say, no, you can't take that away. This is something that I really love. And Disney did two things with that. One, they showed, there's two things. One, they showed the canon is not sacred which is actually a big problem because that means all, all of Star Wars can be completely remade now. Nothing is sacred. That's one hell of a precedent to create. Oh yeah. But the other problem that it opened up is that those sequels, the Star Wars novels, they themselves, how do I put this? They were a product of the first generation of Star Wars nerds. Mm-hmm. The people who saw all the movies in theaters, which I didn't do. I, I was too young by the time Return of the Jedi came out. I, I was not born yet. And furthermore, like some of them, like uh, the Rogue Squadron trilogy, the Throne, Hand of Thrones, yeah, Heir to the Empire, they themselves have fantastic storylines that follow the hero's journey. And it's because all they had for Star Wars were those three films. So if that alone is the blueprint that you're using, then your work is going to be very similar to it. But at the same time, they did, you know, take... um, they did a good job at getting some very minute aspect and expanding it, such as Michael A. Stackpole when it came to the Rogue Squadron series. He got uh, he wanted to tell a story that did not involve the Force. He just wanted to tell like a World War II story that involved the Rebels. Actually, no, forget that. He wanted to tell Top Gun with X-Wing pilots. Top Gun is a Star Wars movie. Just replace the words Top Gun with Rogue Squadron. And it's Rogue Squad. It's that simple. It, it irritates me so much that Disney is somehow having difficulty making a Rogue Squadron movie. I mean, it's been three awesome video games. It's been like half a dozen awesome novels, many more comic books, and so many more card games and board games, table games. Rogue Squadron is already an awesome movie. If someone is unable to make it, then they shouldn't be the ones making it. Yeah. Anyway, and by the way, I want to say Wedge Antilles has an incredible hero's journey of his own. I mean, I'm actually, I subscribe to the fan theory that he actually suffers from survivor's guilt. I've heard that. Yeah, yeah it was expanded in, I believe, the short story, A uh, Certain Point of View, one of those collections for, I think it's the Return of the Jedi one. I mean, think about it. Wedge Antilles goes from saying, look at the size of that thing to blowing up the second Death Star and saying, I'm already on my way out. Just this incredible journey he was able to go through as such a minor character. And from what I understand, um, uh, Lucas deserves credit for actually bringing Wedge back in Empire Strikes Back. From what I understand, that was him responding to um, fan appreciation for the character. Going back, though, when it comes to The Last Jedi, so, so several things. One, you have the expanded universe, which is real, it's literally the product of a hive mind hundreds of special effects, I'm sorry, hundreds of science fiction writers that almost like through democratic vote, their works have entered into the public appreciation based on its popularity, based on its success, storytelling, etc. Like we see different elements of it float to the surface. We see new characters like Mara Jade or Karan Horn or I don't know, um, Darth Talon also entering public um, imagination for many different reasons. So on top of all of that, you have the Star Wars sequel trilogy, where when it comes to The Force Awakens, uh, The Force Awakens, so I saw that movie on opening night. I was seated right next to a very dear friend of mine who had actually seen the original Star Wars on opening night. And he and I were both disappointed with the film, but we did not think it was a bad movie. So first of all, I was seeing it, comparing it against, and really the thing I was really focusing on was... um, when it came to the character of Kylo Ren, Ben Solo. I was really comparing him against the children that Han and Leia have in the expanded universe. Yeah, Jason Solo and, uh, yeah. Exactly. That was one thing that I had um, where there's a noticeable disconnect and it's going into a completely different direction. But 
I loved the parts of The Force Awakens that, again, could have taken place in the expanded universe if they really wanted it to. When it comes to the character of Finn, for example, Finn easily could be in the expanded universe. And he's someone who I was actually expecting him to be sort of the, I was expecting him to be sort of Luke Skywalker. Or no, no, no. I was expecting him to be the Aragorn Mm. in this trilogy. In the sense where he's part of an ensemble of heroes, but you don't realize his importance until the story goes on. And The Last Jedi completely, completely rejected it. I mean, I don't know what the decision making was when it came to that, but um, if you are a fan of Finn, you have every reason to be furious and disappointed at Disney and the creative minds behind the Star Wars sequels because of what began in The Last Jedi when it came to treating his character. And when it comes to, I mean, a lot of the the sexism, when it came to, I mean, the racism and the sexism and all the vitriol that was thrown against the, uh, uh, against the sequel trilogy, I mean, I'm not going to defend any of that. I will say, though, that there are plenty of reasons to disagree with the decisions they made for these films that do not make you a racist or a sexist or any other terrible things. When it came to Rey, I actually really like Rey as a character, and I actually thought she was magnificently acted. I loved the the theme that John Williams wrote for her. She seemed to me like a very good addition to Star Wars in general, in the sense that she would have been an excellent character in the expanded universe, but she's still a great character now in the Star Wars universe. My problem with her, and I want to say that the late master of the Jedi Order, Samuel L. Jackson himself, had a problem with her. He just didn't like her lightsaber choreography, and I didn't either. It was odd. She actually, in The Force Awakens, she really used her lightsaber as almost like a, almost like a cattle prod. Like, if you touch the person <laughs> with it, you will win the fight. And don't get me wrong, the order of the fighting was really cool. I love that she, you know, kicks Kylo Ren's head. I actually thought Kylo Ren was dead after she sliced him upside the face. But um, that was my only beef with her in... Um, when it came to Daisy Ridley, she did a wonderful performance, and I feel really bad for her and many of the uh, the people that were involved in Star Wars for so much of the negativity that's been very unfairly thrown their way. I just wasn't really a fan of the fight choreography when it came to her. And it's odd because I actually really liked how um, I liked how Finn was using a lightsaber because he wasn't using it like someone who knew how to use a sword. He was using it, he was using it the way Han Solo was kind of using the lightsaber in Empire when he cuts open the Tauntaun. Like, and, and I want to say, though, uh, I do not know why this is no longer widely discussed in Star Wars, but like Mark Hamill himself said that he was told by Lucas himself that the lightsaber is supposed to be extremely difficult to wield. He said Lucas described it to him as it's Excalibur. It's crazy heavy. It's the kind of thing where you almost need the force in order to move it, in the sense that the force is moving the lightsaber and your arms with it, rather than it actually being a physical melee weapon. That's such a cool uh, way of wording. I'd never heard that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do a Google search for Mark Hamill, Excalibur, and you'll be able to find his comments on that. I think it comes from an interview he did uh, with Frank Oz. I think it was an evening with Mark Hamill and Frank Oz. Two-hour-long video lecture at a at a university it's fantastic anyway going back to the hero's journey so yeah when it comes to uh the last jedi so several problems with that one it's part of a trilogy it could have been the end of the trilogy it ends like it's the end of the sequel trilogy i mean maybe it was going to be two films long from uh from uh, what's it, ryan johnson's point of view i highly doubt that it's just he ended it like that was the end of Star Wars. And I actually think the ending would have been a good ending to it, but it's not. It's the second film in the storyline. It's also one that takes place a few hours after the previous film rather than a year afterwards. So there's almost no, it doesn't allow a lot of opportunity to see what these heroes did on their own, which is something conducive if you're building a new story arc or a hero's journey, because That's what worked very well in Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back takes place a year after A New Hope. And what do we see? That Luke, having completed that one journey in the first Star Wars film, when he came to the destruction of the Death Star, well, he actually, in his freedom to live, is choosing to stay with the Rebellion. 
he's actually choosing to become a commander. We never knew he was a commander before until we see in the opening scrawl that he's been promoted. He's actually leading the rebels to this ice planet. We learn that Han is going to be going in a different direction. His freedom to live, although he originally started, you know, he made the decision to stay with the rebellion and uh, destroy the Death Star, he's now going in a different direction, which is wholly in his character. There is none of that in the first 10 or 20 minutes of The Last Jedi. And I, I'm actually going to, I want to coin something on here. I've been minting this for a while. So there is an experience that I underwent, I shared this experience from what I know. I call it pre-TSD. Pre-TSD is the unique form of post-traumatic stress disorder that Star Wars fans experienced when they saw The Phantom Menace in theaters for the first time. It's the moment about 10 or 15 minutes into the film where you realize, to quote uh, Red Letter Media, something is very wrong. <laughs> I love Red Letter. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know exactly what I'm saying in that Mr. Plinkett video. It's great because he actually dropped that line in the moment where I experienced it. I experienced... I knew something was very wrong when Jar Jar said, excuse me. Uh. I was like, well, that's not Star Wars. That's like Saturday Night Live. That's like late 90s lazy comedy. Like that's, that's Hercules, the legendary adventures. Anyways, what I'm getting at is I felt that same experience. It was a reminder. Was like, oh, yeah, that's what that bad feeling in my stomach was when Poe had Admiral Hux on hold uh, wait, when he said waiting for his mother yeah i mean i don't know if it's because of the lighting because mel brooks had the guy who did the lighting for lawrence of arabia for space balls but the first 20 minutes of space balls with colonel sanders that looks more like a star wars movie than the first 15 minutes or the first five minutes of the last jedi and it's because it doesn't look or sound or follow the very necessary, the very broadest of strokes that make a Star Wars movie. It feels like an MCU film at that point. Uh, no, no, it was a Ryan Johnson film. And the truth is The Last Jedi is very, very much a Ryan Johnson film. And I'm not saying that in a way that's pejorative to him. It's just he has a, a very specific uh, choice when it comes to color palettes, when it comes to his scripts, when it comes to humor, when it comes to, of course, subverting expectations that he does with his films. And it's just um, incredible that out of the acme of talent that Disney had to work with when it came to the middle act of their trilogy, that they didn't go to Alfonso Cuaron, who made the greatest Harry Potter film ever made, in my opinion. Uh, he didn't go to, I'm sorry, Disney didn't go to like, you know, Steven Spielberg or anyone still in Lucas's orbit didn't, or, you know, and there's people within his orbit that he could have gone to, like Robert Zemeckis or, uh, like he might've made an animated Star Wars film if I think about it. Anyways, it's just, it's very interesting that when it came to The Force Awakens, it was a very safe, soft reboot. And I think everyone would describe it that way. It's a very safe Star Wars sequels. It's kind of like something from the expanded universe, but it's also so much of the original Star Wars film remade that it really seems like what they're doing is a soft reboot of the entire Star Wars trilogy. The second, the, the Last Jedi, when it comes to its story arc, I'm going to be honest, I actually don't think it's a good example of the monomyth in cinema because it subverts expectations. And if you're subverting expectations, you're going to be subverting Joseph Campbell. You can't have it both ways. You can't have something that completely shatters the wheel while literally using that wheel to take you across the entire journey. And I understand that it does play a part in this narrative arc that is now considered a hero's journey when it comes to the whole trilogy. But I'm going to be honest, I don't care what anyone says, that's damage control. Disney was in the business of making Star Wars films that made a whole lot of money. They did a very good job with that when it came to The Force Awakens. They did a very good job of continuing that when it came to Rogue One, which a lot of people forget. That movie made over a billion dollars. It was not a numbered Star Wars film. It was, in my opinion, a superior. It was, in my opinion, an inferior work of cinema to The Force Awakens, but a better Star Wars film than The Force Awakens. Yeah. Disney knew what they were doing so far, and then The Last Jedi came around and everything changed. Whether you love the film or not, you cannot say 
that the Star Wars franchise was following the same course. Because it was after that that we saw for the first time ever Star Wars films losing money, of which I'm referring to Solo. And, I mean, it's the same thing when it comes to, like, you know, why was the Conan O'Brien show such a disaster when he had Jay Leno before him? Conan said he had a lousy warm-up act. That was the problem with Solo. I don't think Solo should have been made. It was better than I thought. I, I just personally think that Han Solo works better as a character without a backstory. Nevertheless, I was one of the people who didn't see Solo in theaters just because I was so disappointed with the previous Star Wars film. It made me no longer excited to see Star Wars films in theater. The Last Jedi is actually the last Star Wars film I have seen in theaters, now that I think about it. I do want to say, though, um, last year, I last summer, I did see uh, Return of the Jedi performed with the, the Philharmonics and the Philadelphia Philharmonic Orchestra. Aww. So I'm still seeing Star Wars in public displays. Just the last time I saw a theater, I saw an opening premiere of a Star Wars film, that was The Last Jedi. I will say this though, The Last Jedi had the opportunity, and I thought they were setting this up, to be the continuation of a fantastic story arc when it came to the film. Now I want to make it very clear, there's many different stages when it comes to making a film. Like, you know, a script goes through many, many different revisions. Like, if any of you who are listening to this, if you're interested in going into screenwriting or movie making, this is a very simple homework assignment. Go on Google and read the screenplay to one of your favorite films and just see how the screenplay differs from the film itself. The Goonies, for example, is a good one. Or um, Tim Burton's Batman. Like, those were scripts that went through many different rewrites and you can see a lot of the changes in there. When it came to The Last Jedi, The Last Jedi, in my opinion, should have been, um, it should have suffered the fate of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Monkey King, meaning that it should have been completely discarded and started over again with a new creative mind from the very beginning. They should have pulped the screenplay because it was going to alienate fans and possibly destroy the entire franchise. I personally believe that Disney to this day that all of these television shows, I believe a lot of that is them evolving from what was going to be basically three numbered Star Wars films and one film in between each one of those, which they might have continued after that. But I think that's the reason why Obi-Wan didn't become a movie. It became a television show. It's safer and cheaper to make a television show. Anyways, this, this is where the film started getting my attention and where I was actually really intrigued and I was actually thinking, oh, this is gonna be freaking amazing. It was about a little past the midway point. So now, as you know, Luke gives a, an explanation for how he tried to kill Kylo Ren. That's where he's in his tent, he turns on the lightsaber. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the first, um, outside of Jedi Visions, that's the first flashback in Star Wars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if there's anyone, if there's any nerds out there that know this wrong, correct me. I'm pretty sure that, like, I'm just guessing, being a, someone who has the original trilogy memorized, down to sound effects and alien languages, to the best of my memory, I think when we see Luke turn on that lightsaber in his vision, that's the first in-universe flashback done in Star Wars. What's very interesting about that is when we saw Kylo Ren explaining the second flashback, where he's trying to show that uh, Luke was actually malicious yeah, he, like Luke was the one who was like you know if anything he was the one who was going to the dark side or something that's where I realized something I realized oh this makes sense I saw an interview with Mark Hamill months before this film came out because I was deliberately trying to isolate myself from uh, the trailers or anything like that first time I ever did that for a film by the way uh, a Star Wars film uh, Mark Hamill said that he really liked the title The Last Jedi because he said it seemed very samurai to me so I was thinking, oh, this is Rashomon. Mm, multiple points of views. Yeah, we're going to be seeing a third and final point of view that's going to be revealing the actual truth of what's going to be happening. Once that happened, I forgave everything the film was doing. I didn't like it, but I forgave it. The casino that was going on there, the complete mishandling of Finn's character, which I'm still so heartbroken about. I wanted to see him become a Jedi at the end of the third and final film. Um, anyways, so this is what this is where using my understanding of storytelling, being a storyteller myself, and being a lifelong Star Wars fan, this is what Ryan Johnson was telling me in the audience when that was happening. Once we saw that second flashback, I was thinking, all right, there's going to be a third and a final flashback 
that shows what really happened. A little bit like Clue when it comes to the three ultimate, uh, the three ultimate endings. Yeah, well, it's Knives Out from Ryan Johnson, so it makes sense. Oh, yeah, exactly. So this is what happens. Well, Snope dies. There's no more Big Bad. I don't care what it says in the beginning of The Rise of Skywalker. I believe Emperor Palpatine was dead until Ryan Johnson chose to kill Snoke. So anyways, once Snoke died, I was like, well, I'm sorry, once Snoke died, I was like, well, what the heck's going on? Who's the main villain? It can't be Kylo Ren. That's where I thought we were going to see the third and final flashback. Now, I apologize. This is going into fan fiction. It's just I'm explaining to you a very, very nebulous understanding of where the film was going. So these are like 10,000 different ideas that were going in different directions over what's going to be happening in this film. In terms of which one of those ideas stayed in my memory, it was this. This was me trying to, you know, like in the dark, trying to grope your way through around where you are, trying to make sense out of the shapelessness. I remembered that about 10 years ago, Mark Hamill was part of a Q&A. And he was at a roundtable discussion with several filmmakers. One of them was actually J.J. Abrams where Mark Hamill said that he was a huge advocate of Luke Skywalker turning to the dark side, and that he was someone who felt that if they do make a sequel trilogy, Luke should turn to the dark side for the purpose of this should be the next heroic arc that he goes on. That if, we're, if Luke's going to be going on another hero's journey, we have to see him go to his lowest point, even if that means Luke Skywalker becomes a villain. I want to make it clear, I know about the Dark Empire series, I know about the expanded universe when it comes to Luke, I was never a fan of it. And it's not that it's wrong. I know that it has its admirers. It's just, it's not the part of Star Wars that I was particularly interested in. I miss the days where if you didn't like where Star Wars was going, all you had to do was just not read the book or not see the movie. You can't really do that anymore because now everything is all in your face. Anyways, what, with that in mind, with uh, Mark Hamill himself at a table of conversation with J.J. Abrams himself saying, there should be a dark Luke. I very stupidly thought that that is where the story was going to go. So I was expecting a third and final flashback where after uh, Snoke is dead, I'm sorry, after Snoke is dead and after Kylo is um, speaking to Rey, I thought we were going to see what really happened, which was Luke turns on his lightsaber, Kylo turns on his lightsaber, basically simplifying it luke tells kylo to rise as his apprentice i mean if i was writing this i would have a placeholder line where it's like is that where mark's like rise like yes uncle i am your master and the two of them massacre luke's students who wouldn't turn to the dark side that's the beginning of the knights of, or what is it the knights of ren of course nothing really happens from uh that was and i believe that would have been uh First of all, we don't even know if that's true. Like that would just be Kylo telling this to Rey to shatter her commitment to Luke, her studying, but um, or you know to like shatter her her faith in him. But um, I was thinking that that was going to be the canonical story that Luke did turn to the dark side. That's why he put himself in hiding. Like you know, part of him that was still attuned to the light side literally dropped himself off the entire map so no one could find him. That's the reason why he's so heartbroken when he sees Rey, when she shows up at the end of The Force Awakens. Like, I was actually thinking when I was in theaters, when I was trying to read his face, like, I didn't know what was going through his mind. Like, is he thinking, this is the person who's going to kill me with that lightsaber? Is this the person who I have to kill? Because, I mean, you know, like, with, with what Yoda says, like, always in motion is the future. I imagine Luke could see where his store like where his future was going but he also knew that it wasn't certain so i honestly thought that um the last jedi was going to end with this heartbreaking heartbreaking reveal that would have been up there with i am your father which is that luke has turned to the dark side luke massacred his own students luke is the big bad in the story he's the emperor palpatine in the storyline which would have i mean every kid and possibly many adults in the audience would have been Luke in that case. They would have been going, no, like sobbing and crying. I don't even know how it would end. I mean, would Ray have, would she have gone to the dark side as well? Would it all have come down to Finn? I mean, all I know is 
even though my mind was going that way, the heartbreaking thing is, I don't know if it would have been possible to film a proper sequel to that. Because if they did, uh, you would need Carrie Fisher to play a much larger role. She like imagine Leia being the person dueling with Luke, almost akin to like Yoda being, uh, dueling with Palpatine. She would have to be the one to talk him down. Or um, at the very least, she has to be dueling with her son to bring uh, Kylo Ren down. Well, you would be having um, like, you know the, the A plot and the B plots coming to a conclusion when it comes to how is Luke's story going to end and how is Kylo Ren's story going to be ending. So that's where I thought Ryan Johnson was going, simply using uh, the Rashomon model when it came to different points of view. And I will say this, they could have still done this, but I actually think this is one thing that's really overlooked when it comes to the sequel trilogy in general, when it comes to its narrative arcs. No Anakin Skywalker. I mean, imagine if Luke turned to the dark side this is where I think people would have forgiven seeing Hayden Christensen's Force Ghost as Anakin. Imagine if half of the third film, the, I'm sorry, the final film when it comes to the rise of Skywalker, Star Wars 9, imagine seeing the ghost of Anakin telling his son, son, I know what you're going through. You have to stop it. You rescued me from the dark side. Don't go down the same way. Like I'm now in the beyond. I know what it's like out there. I understand all the mysteries of the light side and the dark side, you're feeling this for this reason. All of that was lost by just having Luke disappear at the end of um, The Last Jedi. And I mean, and don't get me started when it came to, when it comes to Rey being nobody. I mean, uh, I was of the opinion that Rey could be anybody, but I was particularly irritated when I learned that Rey was briefly tossed around as being a Kenobi. Now, I know that a lot of fans don't like that because it makes Star Wars, it makes the Force sound hereditary. Uh, guess what? The Skywalker saga is all about hereditary Force powers. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's like, I view it as like being a mutant in X-Men. It's not a guarantee, yeah. but it does weigh pretty heavily. If you imagine that final scene in The Force Awakens, if you entertain, like, I'm going to be honest, this is mostly serendipity, by which I mean it's coincidental. This is your mind trying to make sense of something that isn't there. But if you watch that final scene, like if I was, if we were doing a film analysis right now of that cliffside image with Ray approaching Luke Skywalker, let's imagine right now that we now know that Ray is a Kenobi and we're offering film commentary on it. There's several interesting things on that. One, if she's a Kenobi, she's actually situated where Obi-Wan was when Obi-Wan saw Anakin on the Death Star in A New Hope. Uh, not only that, we actually see that um, with the camera spinning around them, literally a circular shot, the circle is now complete. The music is actually also very similar. Like when we see Luke um, leaning over like that cliff, we actually hear some echoes of the Darth Vader theme over there. How interesting is it that over here, if we're entertaining that Rey is actually Kenobi, she's actually playing the role of Kenobi in her final, in his final duel with Darth Vader as a stand-in with Rey and uh, Luke Skywalker. If Luke Skywalker is playing the role of Darth Vader in this meeting of these two personalities, well, that doesn't sound too good for Luke's character in this trilogy. So it was really a missed opportunity with them um, where they were going with that. When it came to, I will be honest, when it comes to Rey being a Sith weapon, I mean, that did work with Anakin Skywalker. I actually think the whole virgin birth thing with Anakin, I actually think that was the best introduction to the Star Wars mythos since I am your father, especially if you consider what the Phantom Menace could have been. If the Phantom Menace was entirely about Shmi Skywalker, just this enslaved woman in the desert as the main character who's pregnant with this sith monster there's a movie that's like that it's called rosemary's baby yep that would have been an r-rated star wars horror i would have <laughs> loved that and that could have been star wars the force awakens i mean jesus jar jar might have actually been useful in a film like that for comic relief <laughs> and maybe it would have been like a, a priest thrown out the window like in the omen or something like that or i'm sorry like in the exorcist yeah. Anyways, anyways, that's a very long and roundabout way of me saying that uh, The Last Jedi is a very, very good Ryan Johnson film. 
it really is. It's a film that if you're a fan of his storytelling and um, uh, his treatment of characters, the truth is it's that in spades. It's a fantastic example of it. It's also a film that, like it or not, did very much divide Star Wars fans of many different backgrounds and many different interests. I co-wrote uh, my third book with Ian Desher, author of the William Shakespeare Star Wars series. Wonderful, wonderful person, very kind collaborator, dedicated Star Wars fan. He and I were complete opposite ends when it came to The Last Jedi. But nevertheless, like he's only a few years older than me. We are the same audience. And... I guess that's a testament to what a miraculous creation the original Star Wars films were, that they were able to not only create this large audience, but to actually keep it together for as long as they did. It would be very easy for Return of the Jedi to completely shatter fans into a thousand different directions. I mean, look at Godfather 3. So we've gone into deep dives into the original trilogy, the newer ones, and there's also a lot of spinoffs here. We're continuing with the monomyth, and this is great because this is like screenwriting 101 for a lot of people who may not have had the chance to look at this stuff and also just understand the monomyth. Obi-Wan Kenobi, the series from Disney. Does it make a successful lap around the hero's journey? Uh, No, it doesn't. It has a hero's journey that's going through. So first of all, I want to say it succeeded in being a show in the sense that it wasn't canceled midway through and they had Ewan McGregor back, which is a big deal. And I know that Ewan McGregor is um, very passionate about the character Obi-Wan and um, probably one of, if not the best thing to come out of the Star Wars prequels was Ewan McGregor as young uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, which um, people overlook the fact that he's not only following the footsteps, you know, continuing this character, Obi-Wan recasting a major character is always very challenging. But people overlook, Alec Guinness is one of the greatest actors that ever lived. Bridge over the River Kwai is a masterpiece. His death scene in there where he falls on that dynamite plunger is incredible. One of my favorite in cinema. So anyways, just on its surface, that show was going to be having a huge challenge when it comes to continuing a storyline focusing on um, one of my favorite um, characters in fiction. I love Obi-Wan because... Obi-Wan as an archetype, as a character, he's the magical helper, of course, in the hero's journey. I mean, he is Merlin. He's so many different wizards in, you know, he's Gandalf. He's so many wizards in mythology, in um, stories, in epics, and just masterfully portrayed by Alec Guinness. He was nominated for an Oscar. A lot of people forget the first uh, Star Wars and so many Oscar nominations. I think the only nomination in Star Wars history for acting, I should mention. Not to knock anybody. And Guinness thought the the whole premise of the film was pretty silly, didn't he? He thought it was silly, but he saw that there was some promise to it. We do have some interviews with him. And also, a lot of people overlook this, that he actually made the second most money from the first Star Wars after George Lucas. Really? Yeah, he signed a very generous um, percentage when it came to Star Wars. I think he got, at the time, $40 million, which is lots of money adjusted for inflation. Uh, what irritated out Guinness was the fandom that came with it. He had, of course, made many other films. He didn't want to be forgotten. By the way, a little detail. There is um, a, a whodunit movie. Uh, there's a whodunit murder mystery called Murder by Death. I think it came out in 1976. From what I read, Alec Guinness, who has a small role in that film, he was actually reading the screenplay to A New Hope while he was shooting that film. You want to see like, a little glimpse of what the actor was going through. But anyway, when it comes to the hero arc, so there's one thing that's really, really lacking and in, in the series that we won. Well, first of all, it's already a challenge when you're getting a character from someone who already finished the hero's journey. Because the truth is, with many people, the hero's journey is just a very small part of their life. I mean, Marty McFly, he goes on a hero's journey, wonderful hero's journey. But because of time travel, that was only a single weekend of his life, when you think about it. I mean, years of information happens before him that we never have access to. There's an entire life ahead of us, ahead of him, that's left to the imagination. The truth is, we don't need to see the entire life of Marty McFly in order to be told a good story or to understand this very pivotal hero's journey that he goes through. The problem with Obi-Wan is twofold. One, Obi-Wan had already gone on a, a journey of his own when he came to the Star Wars prequels. It's a tragedy. But it's also one where he still survives and he goes back to where we 
see him starting. Now, I want to say in storytelling, and this really applies to me when I'm writing history, I love it when I know exactly how my characters began before my story and what happened afterwards. Because all the heavy work has been done, you know how they're going to die. You know when they were born, you know what their height was, you know what their favorite foods were, all that kind of stuff. Obi-Wan should have been a very, very easy story to write because we know exactly what Obi-Wan Kenobi is like at the end of the story. He's Alec Guinness in the beginning of A New Hope. And I always loved Alec Guinness in A New Hope because he's kind of a morally great character. Mm -hmm. He uses the Jedi mind trick all the time. When it comes to Moss Eisley, he's like a wretched hive, scum and villainy. He almost sounds like he has a bit of pride when he says that. Like, yeah, that place is a real garbage heap. I mean, I've been there. I know what it's like. He's someone who actually is very much in control of his miserable environment. But he's, you know, he's not starving to death. He's still getting by there. I, we need to see Obi-Wan go from being, you know, like Ewan McGregor stroking his beard at the end of Revenge of the Sith to being Obi-Wan lifting his hood and saying hello there. But also Obi-Wan having no problem doing Jedi mind tricks. Obi-Wan being really chill in the original trilogy and then cutting a guy's arm off no problem doing that not only cutting a guy's arm off but looking at everybody in a bar after he does it listen i don't know about you i always assumed that was the first time obi-wan had even used his lightsaber in quite a while mm -hmm. or at the very least used it in public because it's at that moment that in his own hero's journey he can no longer stay in tatooine because what happens right after obi-wan uses the lightsaber han says it looks like a couple of people have taken an interest in your handiwork. The stormtroopers go towards them. Now, this is going to sound weird, but I have evidence for this. You know the infamous scene, and I'm saying infamous. You know the infamous scene in Obi-Wan where Obi-Wan does the um, the trench coat thing with uh, young with uh, young Princess Leia? I heard about this, yeah. It's all, yeah, basically, um, he there's a part where they need to sneak away with young Princess Leia so what Obi-Wan does is he does the old, you know, like three short people in a trench coat effect. He covers her in this really big coat, in this coat, looks ridiculous while he does it. And they walk past all these Imperials in the Imperial base. Now, I'm just going to say this. Obi-Wan has the ability to make himself appear invisible and to make other people appear invisible in the original trilogy. He does it when they're in the cantina. What happens is when the stormtroopers come over to Obi-Wan, Luke and Obi-Wan, they are there. The stormtroopers see them. They're walking towards them. And what happens? All of a sudden, they're gone. Now, you could say they snuck away. But at the same time, we see throughout the entire Death Star that Obi-Wan is using the Jedi mind trick at a distance quite a lot. I honestly believe that Obi-Wan using the Jedi mind trick can make himself appear invisible. And I don't mean that like if you had like a pair of eyes looking at him, you don't see him. Or if you have a security camera and you don't see him. What I'm saying is he's able to confuse people around him to the point that it's as good as if he was never there. Because it explains how he does a lot of his maneuvering. A little something like that could have made Obi-Wan a much more interesting character and a much more believable character in terms of how he's using the Force. He's using the Force not for knowledge or defense. He's using it for manipulation. He's using it as more of like a way of like a desperate type of survival rather than self-defense. And that's the kind of decision-making that is necessary to survive in a place like Tatooine. And it's also the kind of thing that I feel like would have made Obi-Wan a little bit more jaded when it came to the Force by the time the um, a New Hope comes around. But there's one really big thing that's lacking. And I want to say this is not one of the stages in the uh, hero's journey, but this is like, you know, a major character in the hero's journey, and that is the shadow self. The biggest problem with the Obi-Wan Kenobi series is it does not have a proper adversary when it comes to Obi-Wan. People think that it's Darth Vader, but I'm just going to say it, it's not Darth Vader because we had already seen Obi-Wan kick Darth Vader's ass. When he was young and at his strongest, he literally chopped off all but one of his limbs. He's not going to be becoming more intimidating after that obi-wan had already faced him at his peak and he beat him really really badly so any decision making that comes from there whether there's another duel there's two duels they did two duels i can't believe they did that 
I mean, that's just fan fiction. Yeah. In my opinion, when it came to Al Kenis, with that Oscar nomination, when he faces Darth Vader in the Death Star, I believe, and I believe the whole world believed until that series, that that was the first time Obi-Wan had seen Darth Vader since he left him for dead. Which, I can say this as an educator and an MTU, must be so tragic. I can't imagine, like, when it comes to Alan Guinness, he did his performance, channeling his emotion in there. But, like, you don't even need the prequel trilogies when it comes to appreciating how horrifying that must be for him having lost a student that has helped destroy the galaxy and Obi-Wan sees him and he is this mechanical nightmare. Have you seen the uh, YouTube clip where it's Luke and Kenobi in his little kind of hovel in Tatooine and he asks, Luke asks Kenobi about his father. And, you know, he's just kind of stroking his beard and he starts talking about, oh, he was a great starfighter pilot. He fought in the Clone Wars and it starts playing like echoes of stuff from the prequel. Yeah, I've seen that. Oh my God, give me chills every time. And I was like, you don't even need to hear that though to understand the heartbreak that Kenobi experienced. So yeah, when we get to that pivotal scene, it's all there. You never needed a prequel to understand the emotional trauma that both of those guys experienced. And also the difficulty that's on Obi-Wan's face when Luke asks, how did my father die? Yeah. I've heard mixed things over whether or not Lucas was always intending Vader to be Luke's father. But one way or another... Obi-Wan, I mean, when it comes to Alec Guinness, he gave a good enough performance for it to go in any direction without it making the film worse. That's the problem with any sequel. One basic role, a basic role that any sequel should have is they should make the previous film a better film. It should be a complement to the party that it's joining, not making it worse. That meeting between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader, that first duel, is worse. It's cheapened. If you have Obi-Wan facing him three times and defeating him another time. It's just, you're robbing the drama from it. Now, this is, this is one thing though that makes a big difference. In Solo, which as I said, I mean, when we came to Solo, I consider it the equivalent of shovelware, but at the same time, <laughs> it worked better than I was expecting. It was a film for the purpose of being a film to make people go to the theaters and make money. And anyways, what I'm getting at though is they established that Darth Maul is still alive. You can't change it. They had a Star Wars film where Darth Maul is still alive. I have a sign. I'm going to show you something real quick because I'm pissed about this. Sure, sure, sure. So there are people at home who can't see this. Here is my graduation gift from high school. It's a signed copy by Ray Parks in Darth Maul's <laughs> outfit. That was my graduation gift from my dad. Oh, wonderful. I, I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, Ray Park would have liked what I was expecting with this series or what I would have done. I, I love Obi-Wan. I've been talking about uh, what Obi-Wan did on Tatooine for decades. But some like really established science fiction writers have pulled their thoughts, what they wanted to think. I mean, the first question I asked was as simple as, do you think Obi-Wan got laid on Tatooine? <laughs> no, didn't say with a man or a woman or didn't say even with another humanoid. Just curious. Like, do you think he had sex at some point while he was on uh, Tatooine. And that's just a, a lot of people, they, they couldn't decide. So I think, well, he's like a monk. Maybe like he did absolutely nothing. So I was like, no, no, the Jedi Order has been destroyed. He probably bought a prostitute or something like that. Right. Or he might have actually had to, being undercover, to look like a regular person or something like that. So first of all, I did hear that um, they did have a love interest in the, the series that was cut out. It was um, portrayed by that one actress from Game of Thrones, that played Ilaria Sand in Game of Thrones. She was actually very well cast in Obi-Wan. She was perfect casting in Star Wars. I, I liked seeing her in that universe and I'm sad in the video play more of a role with her. So anyways, they could have had him going through an arc, including of course, possibly temptation when it comes to Obi-Wan experiencing physical love with someone or even emotional love. Cause again, the Jedi aren't supposed to love. If we saw him going through the same journey as Anakin Skywalker, when it came to feeling love, well, that itself is going to be a drama that needs to have some sort of satisfactory resolution in order for Obi-Wan going back to being the Obi-Wan that we see in A New Hope. They could have injected a love story that could have shown that that's the reason why Obi-Wan is even still alive hmm. after all that's happened at his hand. I mean, like in Return of the Jedi, Obi-Wan says like, 
He just said the understatement of the century. Like, I thought I could instruct him just as well as Yoda. I was wrong. Maybe Obi-Wan struggled with suicide as he was in isolation. I mean, maybe it was like, you know, maybe like the Jedi had always been totally messed up in the head in a way no different than the, the trauma the child soldiers go to. Right. When it comes to their experience going to the Jedi, all of that could have been in there and it wasn't. But there's one thing, since you brought up that you showed me that picture of Darth Maul, this is what I think was lacking. There's two things in Star Wars beyond the films that I'm a huge, huge fan of. And I'm going to mention one of them right now. When it comes to the Star Wars Rebels series, they have a final battle between Obi-Wan and Darth Maul on Tatooine. Yeah, I've seen that. That is, in my opinion, the best writing we've seen for Star Wars outside of the original trilogy. It's a Kurosawa scene. It's ripped right out of Kurosawa. It's just like something out of Seven Samurai. The writing, the, the attention to detail. Look at what I've risen above. Turning the meme of I'm on the high ground. Because I'm going to be honest, the high ground was a joke that has since become embraced by Star Wars fandom. And such a fitting end to Darth Maul. It's like I said, I mean, in my opinion, Darth Maul was dead when he fell down that tunnel. But he's back. Can't change it. He was in the movie Solo. We should have seen him, but Obi-Wan's shadow self. I was expecting to be entirely about Obi-Wan on, on um, the planet, uh, Tatooine. But if there is going to be larger world building going on, if we're going to be seeing sort of a parallel story going on with any forces in the Empire, it shouldn't be Darth Vader. It should be Darth Maul, the guy who played such a major role in Obi-Wan's original story arc and also in the story arc of Anakin Skywalker and thus the entire galaxy. We should have seen Darth Maul do a comeback and it should have been like God of War. We should have seen Darth Maul on a rampage, killing everyone around. Like, first of all, like it's like Emperor Palpatine. Somehow he survived. There's no way around it. He survived. Well, what the heck did he do afterwards? It looks like he was sort of like a, a gangster in uh, Solo. I don't think he knows who Darth Vader is at that point. Imagine if he finds out that the Emperor and Palpatine are the same person. And he finds out that the Emperor has a new apprentice. Oh. If he is supposed to be a Sith, it's his duty to kill that apprentice. The rule of tool proposed by Darth Bane. I wanted to see, I know, I wanted to see Darth Maul killing any pretender. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it? That Darth Vader is training as an apprentice. The Inquisitors, they're dead. Third sister, she's dead. All of them. And finally, imagine a duel between Darth Maul and Darth Vader and the Emperor is watching. From, Emperor, from Palpatine's perspective, it's win-win. This is the Emperor going, good, good. Like, he wins either way. He gets a superior apprentice. This is what I would have done in this situation. If I was doing this, I would be having parallel storylines going on with Obi-Wan on Tatooine going through his story there. I'd probably have, I'd probably show Obi-Wan spending a lot more time understanding the force and learning about it. Like I even would have had Yoda in there. And first, and probably the most misused character in terms of the story arc was Qui-Gon Jinn. Qui-Gon Jinn should have been the magical helper that should have been playing such an in-person role when it comes to Obi-Wan during this time, if we're just focusing on him, because that's, that's how the prequel trilogy ended. Yoda says, I will teach you with what I'm learning from this new, you know, teacher of mine, which is Qui-Gon Jinn. None of that happens. That's how the story begins. And that's where it's supposed to be continuing. I mean, on top of that, if you have Yoda in there, you could even have like a B plot or a C plot on Dagobah with Yoda. Who knows? Maybe some force from beyond ends up tracking Yoda down. And maybe that is what led to the cave being a strong place in the dark side. Maybe that's some Darth Tyrannus. Maybe we actually see a Sith ghost that tracks down uh, Yoda and the two of them have their duel. And like Yoda defeats the ghost of uh, Darth Tyrannus and that is the cave. But anyways, when it comes down to like this God of War situation that I'm talking about, what I, was, what I think should have happened is Darth Maul should have been in there regardless. He should have been the Darth Vader in the story instead of Anakin Skywalker. We should have seen him explaining why there are no other Sith in the original trilogy except for Vader and Palpatine. We should have seen Darth Maul killing all of them. And this is what I would have done. You know how I said that we could have seen a scene like on Coruscant where Darth Vader and Maul are doing each other? I would have had Maul 
kick Vader's ass. <laughs> I'm talking like Vader would be cut to pieces again. He might have even lost the one living arm that he had left. I could have actually seen him furious at the Emperor, like, this is my replacement? Like, you call yourself a Sith Lord? Because keep in mind, Darth Maul wants to take Palpatine's place. One to control the power, the other to crave it. This this is what I would have had Maul do. I would actually have Maul say he's not going to kill Vader because he's not actually a Sith. He's still Anakin Skywalker. Uh. The Force is still with him, and that Palpatine failed in making Anakin his apprentice. Like, this whole Revenge of the Sith is a failure because Anakin Skywalker is still alive. So what he's going to say is he's going to go and destroy every remnant that there was of Anakin Skywalker, starting where he first saw him, which is on Tatooine. And so what happens, Maul goes to Tatooine. That's where him and Obi-Wan have their final fight. And I would not have changed it at all from how it was in Star Wars Rebels in terms of writing, like scenario, etc. I loved what they did over there. Yeah, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's a one stroke kind of thing. It, it reminded me of all the black and white Kurosawa films the 47 Ronin, everything where it's the tension. It's kind of like in Hero, the Jet Li film where he's facing off with Donnie Yen, who is in Rogue One, where they are about to fight. And instead of going right into the fight, it cuts to, this is why I love Hong Kong cinema. It's fantastic. <laughs> they go to a black and white version of the exact same scene with both of them facing off. And between them is a, is, it looks like Go. I don't know for sure if it was Go. Yeah, the raindrops are falling on it, if I remember. Yeah, and they have a battle of the minds. Like, if he does this, I do this. If he does that, I do that. And it's all these reposés and counters and so forth. And then a person playing one of those kind of long lap guitars they haven't time. They're beautiful. I can't remember the name. The string breaks, and they both snap back to reality, and then they go into it. And it's that kind of tension that makes that fight scene 10 times better than it already was. And that's what they do with this Kenobi scene in Rebels that was beautiful to me. It's not about all the flash and glamour because you've already seen all that before. Yeah, he goes from Kenobi's standard view to he goes to Qui-Gon Jinn's pose mm -hmm. in uh, The Phantom Menace. Shicho. Yeah, which is the one that got him killed. That, like, that's an, as I said, a very simple, a low bar for any sequel is it makes the preceding works better. That scene made The Phantom Menace a much better movie. It made The Duel of Fates, what many people consider the best part of that movie, an even better one, because it shows the ripple effects that it had. They're literally communicating with each other using those otherwise brief shots that an editor chose to keep into that otherwise poorly edited film. So anyways, all that together, when it comes to the, the hero arc, it's really more like a, it's like a zigzag when it comes to Obi-Wan. It's, it's not a good example of the Joseph Campbell monomyth. It's a, it's a good example of, I would actually use that as a lesson with students of saying, where should it be going in this case? Because I mean, stories like these are already told. When it comes to Obi-Wan, we know Obi-Wan's story, you know, we know what his story was after the prequels. He was on Tatooine guarding Luke Skywalker. He says that's what he was doing. There's no way anybody can persuade me that Obi-Wan did anything but stay on Tatooine watching Luke Skywalker. Because he failed so much when it came to Anakin Skywalker. In fact, this, this is actually something that was really important. We never hear it explained why Obi-Wan only refers to himself as a Jedi Knight in the Star Wars original trilogy. I actually could see Obi-Wan demoting himself from Master down to Knight. I can see saying, I don't deserve the title. I never should have been a master. Half of those masters shouldn't have been masters. I could see him just going back to being a foot soldier, a, a servant in the force, and that his role is just the very simple role of keep this boy alive. And I could actually see him viewing that as almost being the kind of responsibility that was the exact opposite of what the Jedi were told, where the Jedi were taking children and turning them into their soldiers. I mean, we don't even know that much about Obi-Wan's own childhood or his own past. I could see him trying to give Luke the childhood that he didn't have, which was just a freedom to live. So, I mean, there are good parts of it, but on a whole, I think it was, I mean, I think very diplomatically that this, the original Star Wars trilogy is a better movie without the Obi-Wan Kenobi series.
And there you have it, part one of Jacobo de la Quercia's preface. I hope you enjoyed that. A lot of great storytelling, monomythical goodies in there. I particularly enjoyed comparing the older Star Wars with the newer Star Wars IPs and trying to dissect trajectory. Not only are we talking initially about Jacobo's own experience from academic to encouragement from peers and colleagues alike, and then segueing into the hero's journey throughout that case study using Star Wars, we're able to glean more about his own interests, preferences, the things he admires in storytelling and what can be improved while simultaneously, like I mentioned at the top, taking a deep dive into the monomyth. If you've never heard of the monomyth before of the hero's journey, that's totally fine because you've been enjoying it more than likely your whole life, which is why I recommended reading that's going to be in the show notes is Joseph Campbell's seminal work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Pretty much required reading if you're interested in writing fairy character-centric stories with a redemption arc, for example, or a prophesied farm boy who becomes the chosen one in all caps. There is a part two to this that'll be coming out relatively soon, wherein Jacobo and I go into his preface proper and really deep dive into his own experience going into doubts, setbacks, all the things that we explore here on the author's preface. Like I mentioned at the top, if you'd like to learn more about Jacobo, jacobodelacuercha.com as well as on Twitter at Jacobo underscore de la underscore Q. And if you're a fan of Shakespeare, I strongly recommend reading License to Quill. Fun, quirky, insightful, historically accurate, super well-researched novel. The historicity within it, top-notch. Just had a blast reading it. Not often I get to read books that have me smiling and laughing. It's tough to pull off, but Jacobo does it in License to Quill. So if you're looking for a strong place to start in his library, License to Quill. Regardless, part two will be coming out relatively soon. So perhaps ding that notification bell. And if you're enjoying the pod, of course, rate and review. It is appreciated. So until part two of Jacobo de la Quercia's preface, stay humble, folks.